it's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be back here and in this wonderful place. I want to thank Andres and Ricardo, who I see there, for putting on such a wonderful event. In fact, I wanted to begin it with some art, with this uh, Van Gogh's uh, Starry Night, because as this festival celebrates, there's a connection between art and music and science, and that is that they all force us to confront the reality in which we live and give us a new perspective on our place in the universe. And that's what I want to do for you here a little bit in, re in relationship to the issue of what's the point. So I want you to imagine for a moment that you're in a different kind of universe and that you're actually living on an icicle. I don't know if you get icicles here in, in Mexico. I hope you do. But on a winter morning, you look out on your window and you see these beautiful patterns of icicles in all sorts of different directions. I'll, I'll point to these over there and there. And when we're, we're lucky enough to stand outside the icicle, and we can see that they point in all sorts of different directions. But I want you to imagine for a minute that you lived inside this picture, that you lived on one of these icicles, that you lived on maybe along there, along that frame right there. And if you lived there, there'd be something very special about the universe in which you lived. That one direction would be very different than all the other directions. The direction along the spine of the icicle would be very different. And if you were a physicist in that world, you'd say there's something very special about that direction. And maybe if you were a theologian, you'd say there's some purpose to that direction, that God made that direction special. And you'd fight wars about that direction. But we can see from out here it's just an accident. Now I want to suggest to you that, in fact, one of those remarkable things that we've discovered in the last 50 years is that our universe is very much like that icicle. And I want to take you through that in just a few minutes, if I can. So that's, I want to go from that universe to the one that we see. And I, hopefully I pressed it hard enough. We'll see if that works again. There we go. This is the universe in which we actually live. These, this is looking out with the Hubble Space Telescope at galaxies. There are 100 billion galaxies in our observable universe, and here with the Hubble Space Telescope, we can see galaxies almost as far away as they are, as they can be, are visible for us right now. We can, the, the faintest dots in that image are galaxies that are literally 10 billion light years away. It takes the light from those galaxies 10 billion years to get to us. And, that, and since, in fact, our own sun will only live about 10 billion years total, most of the stars in that image don't exist anymore. And any civilization around the stars is long gone. And any civilization that had a beautiful event like this is long gone. And if they took a picture of us right now, 10 billion years from now, when they got the image, we would be gone and everything we've done here would be forgotten. But we are able nevertheless to look at this universe because of light. And light is what I want to focus on now. Light can travel right across the whole visible universe. And we've learned, in fact, about 150 years ago, that light is nothing other than a wave. James Clerk Maxwell told us that light is a wave of electric and magnetic fields moving through space. And that picture of electromagnetism combining electricity and magnetism was the first great unification in physics. Two forces that seemed very different came out looking very much the same. Electricity and magnetism became unified together in a single force. Now, the world has changed, and we now picture electromagnetism in a very different way because we've discovered quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics tells us that on microscopic scales, the universe is very different than we ever thought it would be. And a person who changed the way we picture electromagnetism, one of my own personal heroes, is a physicist, Richard Feynman. And he said there's a different way to picture the interaction of two electric charges in a quantum mechanical world. And he drew a diagram, which we now call a Feynman diagram, and this is the picture of two electric charges interacting. And in the quantum world, we now understand that one electron, which is an electric charge here, interacts with another electron over here to produce an electric force by exchanging a particle corresponding to an electromagnetic wave. That particle is called a photon. It's the quantum of light. But this particle is not a real particle. It's what we call a virtual particle. You can't see it. 
The laws of quantum mechanics are very much like the laws of business and government, I suppose. If you can't see it, anything goes. And in quantum mechanics, it turns out that particles can do things that they couldn't do classically. They can go faster than light. They can su suddenly appear and disappear. As long as they appear for a time so short you can't measure them, then it's okay. And this photon is emitted from this electron and it carries a little bit of energy. Where did that energy come from? It violates something we call the conservation of energy. But as long as that photon is absorbed by another electron in a time scale so short you can't measure it, everything is fine. Now that sounds crazy, weird, absurd, but it's true. And how do we know it's true? Because this theory called quantum electrodynamics is the best theory of science in nature. Using these ideas of virtual particles, we can calculate the properties of atoms and compare them to experiment and we get agreement to 10 decimal places. There's no other place in all of science where you can take a fundamental theory and compare it to experiment to that accuracy. So we know these virtual particles exist and we know this is the correct description of the one of the, one of the forces of nature. But there are other forces of nature. They do other things. In fact, there's one very important force of nature responsible for our existence. It's responsible for the existence of the sun. We're only here because of the power generated inside the sun. That power is generated by nuclear reactions in the sun. Billions and billions of hydrogen bombs going off every second. Those nuclear reactions are go governed by another force, a force called the weak force. And it operates not on a scale across the universe like electromagnetism, but only on the scale of a microscopic nucleus at the heart of an atom. And we can picture the nuclear reactions that happen like this. This is an atomic nucleus decaying. And it, it decays because a particle called a neutron decays into other particles. Now you may find that strange because most of the particles in your body are neutrons. But neutrons are actually radioactive. A free neutron exists for only 10 minutes before decaying. And I will be speaking for more than 10 minutes total. It may seem like five hours, but it's more than 10 minutes. But you're still here. It's an accident of nature that when you put a neutron in a nucleus, it's perfectly stable for most nuclei. But every now and then one will decay. Those reactions power the sun. Now this force looks very different than electromagnetism. Very different. Electromagnetism operates across the universe. This force operates only across the size of a nucleus. But physicists said, well, maybe we can try and understand this force as follows. There's electromagnetism, but maybe we can picture the force with a similar kind of Feynman diagram that describes the decay of a neutron. If you can see here, a neutron decays into a proton, and there's the particles that come out. But maybe we can describe that force also by the exchange of a virtual particle. But that force only operates inside the nucleus, whereas electromagnetism operates across the size of the universe. How could they be different? Well, if this particle has a very heavy mass, then that force can only operate over a very small scale. Because when you emit that particle, you produce a lot of energy. A lot of energy. But remember, that violates energy conservation, so that energy has to disappear. But if, it, if, it, if you produce a lot of energy, that energy has to disappear in a very short time. That means that force can only propagate over the size of a nucleus. So this was the idea, that maybe there's a force that's like electromagnetism, responsible for the processes inside the sun, but it's prop, it's, it it's propagates by the exchange of a very heavy new particle. Sounds very nice. The problem is when we did the mathematics of that, you come up with craziness. It doesn't work. Electromagnetism works because the photon has zero mass. All of the mathematics works out nicely. When you put a massive particle in, you get craziness. And so physicists were stuck 50 years ago trying to understand how we could understand this new force of nature. And someone had the idea that maybe this particle doesn't really have a mass. Maybe it just acts like it has a mass. And the, the idea is the following. Say you're going swimming. 
you could swim very fast in water. But if you fill your swimming pool with molasses, I don't recommend that, by the way, but if you did and tried to swim, you wouldn't be able to swim very fast. You would act like you're much heavier. And so a bunch of physicists, one physicist named Peter Higgs and a few others in 1965 suggested maybe, maybe in nature there's a background invisible field everywhere throughout the universe that you can't see. But some particles interact with that field, and when they interact that, with that field, it's like trying to swim through molasses. They act like they're heavy. They really have no mass at all. But they act like they're heavy just because of that accident of that field that froze in, presumably, in the early history of the universe. So we could now picture this idea of unifying two forces in nature. There's electromagnetism. And then this other force called the weak force would be due to the exchange of other particles which are really massless. But those other particles interact with this background field and act like they're massive and that's why the weak force only operates over the size of the nucleus. Now that's a beautiful fairy tale. But imagining invisible forces throughout nature that you can't see, that's religion, that's not science. Science makes predictions. And the great thing about the quantum world is we can predict that if there's, for every field in nature, there's a new elementary particle. And how can you find it if there's a background field in nature that exists? It's very simple. You just have to spank it. You just have to take empty space and put enough energy in to excite real particles out of that field. And we realized in order to discover the particles associated with that field, we'd have to build a machine that was more complicated than had ever been built in the entire history of mankind. Now, I show you here first Gothic cathedrals. Gothic cathedrals exploited the most complex technologies available at the time. They took hundreds of years to build, and they were built to understand the glory of God. We have built 21st century Gothic cathedrals. In Geneva, Switzerland, we built the most complicated machine ever built. If you go to Geneva and you go to the airport and come out of the airport, underneath you is a tunnel that's 26 kilometers around. And in that tunnel, we accelerate particles at 99.99999% the speed of light in that direction. And particles at 99.9999% the speed of light in that direction. So we smash them together. We detect them with the most complex machines that have ever been built, huge detectors, mammoth things, the Gothic cathedrals, as I say, of the 20th century, they push the technology of the current world. The properties of this every second at the Large Hadron Collider, more data is generated than in all the world's libraries. And these complicated machines are designed to build it. They're so big you can't get the scale, so I got a model, namely me, and I put it up there so you could see it. And then we put these together to try and spank the vacuum. And on July 4th, 2012, we produced some events. And those events looked exactly like the particles that would correspond to that invisible field. We produced 50 events. And they looked like this particle called a Higgs particle. And they walked like it. And they quacked like it. And if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. We discovered the Higgs field. What did that tell us? That told us that the world we experience is an accident. The underlying nature of reality is such that all particles in nature are exactly massless. But some particles interact with that background field and get mass and can create stars and planets and people and you and me. But it's just a cosmic accident. If that field hadn't frozen in the beginning of time in the way it did, then we wouldn't exist. We are just like the physicists on that icicle. And the direction that seems special to them, to us, is the fact that we're massive and other things aren't. But just as there's no purpose to that accident, the accident of nature of the Higgs field forming was a beautiful cosmic accident. There is no point to the universe. It's an accident. But now, does that mean there's no point to life? Absolutely not, because that accident has allowed us to be here today, 
to celebrate art, music, science, and literature. And the point of living is the fact that this cosmic accident has allowed us to use our brains to understand the world around us and to celebrate the phenomenon of being human as we're doing here today. So thank you very much. Thank you.